Welcome everyone to the new Fly Fisher. I'm your host, Phil Rowley. On today's show, we're joining you from the scenic Crow's Nest River located in southwestern Alberta. Joining us today is Vic Bergman, owner of the Crow's Nest Angler. Vic's been fly fishing these waters for over 20 years. Today, he's gonna to show us some of his favorite fall techniques. It's gonna be nymphing, sight fishing. It's gonna be an exciting show. I know you're gonna enjoy it. Fisher has been made possible thanks to Orvis, Ontario, yours to discover, Islander Precision Fly Reels. On today's show, the new Fly Fisher crew is fishing the Crow's Nest River in southwestern Alberta. Joining me today is Vic Bergman, owner of the Crow's Nest Angler located in Bellevue, Alberta. The Crow, as it is affectionately known, is one of the most accessible user-friendly trout streams in the country. The narrow average width of the Crow's Nest makes it ideally suited to walk and wade fishing. A healthy population of rainbow trout is present throughout the entire system, along with mountain whitefish and the occasional cutthroat. History of the Crow's Nest Pass is based primarily, I guess, on coal mining that uh, started uh, back in the late 1800s and it continued right through until uh, the 1980s. And uh, there's a lot of historical sites in the area that you can visit while you're in the Crow's Nest Pass. The Frank Slide Interpretive Center is a great place to, uh, to spend a few hours just learning the history of Crow's Nest Pass and uh, Turtle Mountain and the Frank Slide. The Bellevue Underground Mine Tour is a really good place and the museum in Coleman. Whenever you travel to a system, it's always a good idea to sane the area and see what uh, local aquatic insects are in. So I've got a portable screen here. It's going to put it in the water, and then Vic's going to kick some rocks up above, and whatever he disturbs will be swept downstream into the net. We can have a look at it and choose some flies to match the most predominant food sources we see. Lots of things here, Vic, to imitate. Big, too. Yeah, there's some interesting things here. Got a couple of uh, caddis larvae here, some uh, hydropsyche caddis. Uh, they're net spinning caddis. Uh, a little uh, golden stone fly here that's just uh, shed its uh, uh, skin here. It's in that's kind of neat. You don't yeah. see that very often. And here we've got a large uh, golden stone fly nymph right wow, here. He's a big boy. He is. Okay, I'm just following Vic's advice here. And just by how I bring the fly line back to me, I'm controlling the drag. I'm concentrating on that chartreuse indicator and making it drift drag free as though my nymph was unattached to anything and was drifting like a natural uh, mayfly nymph in this case, down into the run right down the fish's throat. Anytime that indicator pauses, pulls under, I raise the rod. It could be a rock, it could be a trout. Fish on, not sure what. Could be a white fish. We've got both white fish and rainbows in the system. No, I think we have a rainbow this time. So good news. What we came here for. So once again, oh yeah, this is a nice little rainbow. Rainbow. Let me get him there for you. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind doing the honors, Vic. Your river, your fish. There we go. That's a nice. That's a gorgeous. Rainbow. About a 16-inch rainbow, it looks like, eh? Yeah, that's a gorgeous fish. Gorgeous fish, and there we can. I'll just hold the fish in the net, and we can see. There's that little flashback pheasant tail, right, right in the snout. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous fish. So again, we're just using that indicator system. I'm down to about uh, 5x tippet fluorocarbon, about two and a half feet below the indicator, and just a little tungsten bead. About a size uh, 14 scud hook, so it's about a size 16 overall, maybe a little bigger. But that tungsten really helps it get down and tick along the bottom where the trout are. 
many times we just don't work our nymphs deep enough. So we'll just take that out of the way. We'll admire this rainbow. And that's why you have to come to the crow's nest. Just a spectacular fishery. Gorgeous part of the world, easily accessible. Beautiful part of Alberta. You've got to come and come see Vic at the Crow's Nest Angler and he'll take you out and introduce you to these rainbows himself. I'll just sort of head him upstream. Oh, there he goes. There he goes. Back home again. Back home. Thank you. You bet. Well done. <laughs> yep, thanks, Phil. That's a lot of fun. So they're in here. I'll show you here how I'll rig up my nymphing rig. Rather than using a corky strike indicator, I like to use just a small piece of yarn. Uh, the yarn indicator won't make any sort of a splash on the water, unlike some of the heavier uh, corky type indicators that can scare fish. And to do that, I'll just take some uh, yarn here, I'll just cut off uh, just a small little piece, and to attach it to my tippet, I'll form a, a small loop, a second small loop. I'll reach into the second loop and pull the first loop through that. Just insert the strike indicator material into the, into the loop and cinch the loop up tight. Now we've got our strike indicator attached to the tippet. We'll come down here about two feet and we've got our little beadhead nymph and we're ready to give that a try. This is a very fishy looking run, but uh, with this uh, low water, I don't, I don't want to spook fish. How should we approach this? How, what, way, what direction would you give me to, to work this run successfully? Well, I guess because the trout are going to be facing upstream here, we'll want to start by fishing the lower section, the lower portion of this run. And uh, we can gradually move upstream to where that riffle is there. And we've got a really nice seam there with that foam line coming down. Mm -hmm. uh, you definitely want to get some nymphs in there. Fish could basically be anywhere, right from that, that uh, foam line, that seam. I like this indicator setup. That's a pleasure to cast. Yeah, you don't even know it's on. It's nice and light, floats really well. It must be good for, you know, for some of your clients that aren't proficient casters and have to have had enough, enough trouble casting. And then to throw a big corky on to really throw the the extra weight with yeah, an indicator, all yeah. Well, this yarn's basically weightless, so uh, you don't you don't really even know it's on. And I, you know, I would think it's more sensitive too, right? Because mm -hmm. some some of those big corkies they use, you know, you've seen those ones that are like air-filled balls, mm -hmm. and uh, they uh, that's got a fish has got to move that a fair bit, eh? That looks like we've got something here, Vic. Your technique <laughs> works paid. again. It worked. Running around a bit, so it's behaving a bit more like a rainbow, but it could be a white fish. Seems to have that golden glow of a white fish, I think. Nymphs are getting down because it's another good sized white fish. We're holding up in this water. Right in the, got that pheasant tail right in the snout again. And another good white fish. Another good sized white fish here. So we've got both species of fish inhabiting this run, rainbows and white fish. Another one to the net. Thank you, Vic. There we go. You got it. It's got that pheasant tail right in the snout again. We'll hold them upside down and usually that calms them down and we'll put that on. Show everybody at home. See my legs. Show everybody. A, I should face them upstream, but looks to be in good shape. That's a good sized whitefish. How big do they get in here? Eh? Oh, they, they won't get too much bigger than what you see right there. So you know, close to 18 inches, I guess. 17, 18 inches. I'll put up a good tussle, not like a rainbow, but mm -hmm. uh, certainly beats uh, scoring a blank, as they say. We'll let him go, and off he goes. There we go. Just a simple nymph system here that Vic showed me. The yarn indicator using his uh, loop connection to the leader and then a little size 16 tungsten bead pheasant tail. So let's fish in the runs. Let's see if there's a few rainbows there as well now. One of the things I like about fishing on the Crow's Nest River in the fall, we've got low water levels, really clear water. You can do a lot of sight fishing to trout. A lot of the back eddies will hold fish. You can almost find trout rising all day long. 
On a day like today where we've got some overcast, we sh hopefully we'll see some blueing olives. There's a lot of terrestrials around still. If it warms up a bit, we might even get some uh, hopper fishing too. Well, I've got a very nice white fish. I just switched over to a Copper John and right up in this riffle behind me here, he took that fly. At first I thought he was a rainbow, but once I got him a little bit closer to me, I could see that he's a, a white fish. He's a pretty big one too. Okay, calm down. There we go. There he goes. There he goes. The quick release. At this time of the year, you'll find trout holding in almost any type of water in the Crow's Nest River. You might find them in riffles, runs, pools. Uh, a lot of the back eddies that you'll uh, find along the river will also hold trout, so if you're really careful and, and uh, approach these fish uh, quietly, you can sometimes get really close to these uh, trout. On today's show, we use 9-foot, 4-weight rods, matching reels, and weight-forward floating lines. Our leaders were 9 feet long, tapered down to 4x tippet. There's a big kind of an oxbow in here, so the currents are going to be really, really slow. Vic had mentioned a spot he knew of just upstream. This is what we found. It's early afternoon now. The sun's come up, it's got warm, and been able to shed a layer. This is a slow moving pool and we've got a couple of large rainbows, two or three white fish cruising around. Vic's gone upstream to working with the terrestrial. I've still got my nymph on. You've got to sit and study them and watch them. Start to notice the pattern that they're moving. Keep a nice low profile. I'm up on one knee so I can cast. And I'm just watching and stalking. The polarized glasses, critical element. You couldn't do it without them. You have to be able to see through the water see the quarry. So don't just flail away madly. Come in, get calm, stay low, stay still. Let the fish become adjusted to you. Keep your motions to a minimum. You should be able to take one of these fish. Fish on. There we go. I just cast up to the head. We've got a rainbow on here. It was rainbows and white fish and I got my intended quarry. So now I can stand up, of course, and try to find a path down. I've got something over here, a nice gradient. Still got to be safe. Don't want to fall in and break a rod or worse. But I just cast up to the head, let the indicator slowly drift down, and watch it. And it just pulled under, and I set the hook, and beautiful crow. Crow's Nest River Rainbow. Very exciting stuff for do this sight fishing. So I'll stay low. I'll bring him in. Go out in the water a bit. And we'll just let him tire himself out. Bring him in and mire him and let him go. Wet my hands. So there he is, right in the roof of the mouth. Beautiful crow's nest rainbow. So I'm just going to lay my rod down gently. Remove the fly. There it is, little beadhead pheasant tail. There we go. Beautiful fall fish. Sight fishing. The river's low and clear. Prime opportunity on these freestone streams. Away he goes. That was fun. We'll go do that again.
I thought I'd show you some of my favorite fly patterns for the Crow's Nest River for autumn fishing. Uh, starting with some of my favorite nymph patterns, a beadhead pheasant tail nymph, prince nymph, copper john, probably sizes 14 through 16 are some of the most common sizes. Terrestrial patterns are very important on the crow's nest during the autumn. Grasshoppers, beetles, other hatches would include blueing olive mayflies, and this is a CDC blueing olive that I've had really good success with as well. Terrestrials such as ants, hoppers, and beetles are excellent pattern choices at this time of the year. Here is the recipe for the foam beetle Vic used with such great effect today. The hook was a Mustad R50 94840 in sizes 12 through 16. Black 8 aught or 6 aught tying thread. The legs were four strands of moose mane. For the shell back and head, we used 2 millimeter sheet foam in black, and the indicator was orange or chartreuse egg yarn. Be sure to visit our website for complete video tying instructions. Vic's uh, keen eyes just spotted a fish way over on the far bank. It looks to be in about a foot and a half of water, and that's typically where an angler will come through to get to this side because we've seen fish down along this bank as well. Trapes right through that water, spook that fish in. It's incredible. We're way up on the bank here, and we've actually spooked fish from this altitude. These fish see everything. There's another one holding right on this side. There's that. Um willow bush there that has the yellow leaves there and right on the other side of it there's another fish there and he's actually come up a couple of times to feed. Yeah, we've noticed with this afternoon heat we're getting some hopper terrestrial activity so I'm going to change up for my nymph that I was doing well with this morning and as Vic suggested use a terrestrial pattern he's got a beetle I might go with a hopper and see if we can get them on top which will be really exciting. That one took it. All right, that was a lot of fun. Okay, I'm gonna have to climb down this bank here just so I can land them. It's a little steep here, but I'm gonna make a bit of a jump. There we go, he came right up and took that little beetle right, right off the surface. I'll just guide him in here. Let's see if I can get him in the net here. That's a lot of fun when you can see them swimming under the surface of the stream and then come up to eat that little dry fly. There he is. There's a good little rainbow. Let's see if we can get this hook out of him. He's still struggling a little bit. There we go. Like Phil mentioned earlier, if you hold them upside down, sometimes it sort of calms them down and settles them down a bit and they don't struggle quite as much. And we'll get that hook out of them. And there we go. There's a nice rainbow, maybe, I don't know, 18 inches or so. We'll hold them in the water there and until he revives and there he goes. Ready for another day. That was a lot of fun. When presenting dry flies, it is critical to eliminate drag. Drag is the unnatural pulling of a fly at a pace different to the current. Drag is undesirable and often wakes or skates the fly. Most fish reject any presentation containing drag. Let's watch as Bill Spicer shows us a simple cast called the reach cast. It allows flies to drift longer, drag free. In most fishing situations, the fly is the first thing you want to reach the fish. So we must try to add a mend, and usually we mend upstream. Here's a cast that you can add the mend while it's still in the air, and it's extremely easy to do. In this situation, we'll assume that the water is running left to right. So I want to mend my line upstream. So all I do is I reach, as I'm casting, when I'm ready to present the fly, I reach to the left. So all you do is you stop the rod and reach up like so. And you'll see you'll have a straight line between your fly and your rod tip, and it'll be flowing left to right nicely, and hopefully the fly makes it to the fish first. 
In this case, we're gonna assume the flow of the river is right to left. So simply, we wanna mend the line upstream, so I'm gonna reach to the right. So all you do, normal overhead cast, and when you're ready to present the fly, you must stop the rod first and then reach upstream. You do that and you've got a nice straight line from your fly to the rod tip and it's flowing right to left and the fish will see the fly first. And now back to Phil Rowley and Vic Bergman on the Crow's Nest River. on. First cast and uh, nice rainbow here, nice crow's nest rainbow and again we've been doing this all day. It's just working from the bottom of the run up towards the head uh, where the riffle spills into it. And uh, gorgeous crow's nest river rainbow. Unbelievable river. First class, one of Alberta's jewels if you will. Beautiful. Beautiful. Crow's Nest River Rainbow. We're just going to hold them gently and admire them. Let them get a good breath of water. And we'll let them go. So, I really hope you've learned a lot today with Vic and myself on how to fish in the fall, especially here in southwestern Alberta on the Crow's Nest or any other beautiful rivers in this region. You've got to come here and give it a try. So, I hope you've learned a lot. For more information on this and other shows in our informative series, please visit us on the World Wide Web at www.thenewflyfisher.com. From all of us here, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. First cast. <laughs> the new fly fisher has been made possible thanks to Orvis. Ontario, yours to discover. Islander Precision Fly Rails.